All right, shall we start? Okay, so it's now 6.30 in my time. And uh, welcome all of everyone back to the last day of this uh, virtual conference. My name is Xiao Hui Fan. I'm the chair of, uh, of this session. Uh, since one thing about this virtual conference is there's no conference dinner, I'd like to say a few words before we start the last day. Um, I think a couple of months ago, when we got contacted by Steve and Steve about this conference, at that time we were all probably excited, but not quite sure how this whole thing is going to work out. Now, I think we can all agree that the conference has been a huge success. Uh, it has been a wonderful experience for all of us to be able to learn something new, to meet some new people, and to support our colleagues and friends to get a much needed boost uh, in our sort of mostly isolated environment right now. And to show that as a community, uh, not only can we survive this, but we can also strive this in the virtual world. So on behalf of everyone, I would like to give a huge thank you to the two Steve's who organized this conference uh, and to all the members of the SOC and IOC and indeed to all the participants to make this conference a success. Um, we can really clap in webinar, I think, but I hope Steve and Steve can feel all the virtual clap from around the world right now. Um, we'll have a coffee break today to discuss where we go from here uh, and how do we build on this conference to organize more things uh, uh, in the fall and beyond. So now we're gonna start and remind the speakers that I'm gonna give you two minutes warning and uh, all the participants, please uh, post your question on Slack. Okay, so the first talk is by, by J.T. Schindler about X-ray shooter and uh, ELMA sample of quasars in the epoch of randomization. J.T., go ahead. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I'm currently a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy, and I want to start out by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this current work in this setting. So I would like to introduce to you the x ELMA sample of quasars in the epoch of randomization. So when we, um, when we investigate high of quasars, there are multiple questions that we ask ourselves that we want to investigate. And I want to highlight two of them. The first one, how do the first supermassive black holes form and grow? And we try to address this question by measuring black hole masses, adding to luminosity ratios, quasar lifetimes, and the quasar luminosity function. The second question that I want to highlight is, how does feedback shape the onset of galaxy supermassive black hole co-evolution? And to answer this question, we need information on the galaxy host, like the galaxy stellar mass, star formation rate, gas mass, or information on quasar winds. So part of this information we get from the rest frame UV spectrum of the quasar itself. It allows us to investigate the accretion disk, broad emission line regions, intervening absorbers, and the intergalactic medium. Today, I would like to focus on the first two, which give us information on the black hole masses via uh, signal epoch viral estimators, as well as on the line components and line velocity shifts. We then combine this information with information from the galaxy host, which uh, it can be famously provided by ALMA by investigating the C2 150 micron transition. And here are some resolved observations of one of the quasar hosts. So whether the observations are unresolved or resolved, they give us information on the galaxy host, like the star formation rate, dynamical gas mass estimates, and so on. So with the sample that I'm presenting today, we'd like to combine this. Our sample consists of 36 luminous reionization era quasars with ALMA literature data and newly produced x shooter spectroscopy, which we have analyzed within the last year. With our goal in mind to investigate the quasar and its host, both. Here's an overview of our sample and the bolometric luminosity redshift plane with our objects highlighted in solid orange. All of the quasars in this plot have near infrared spectroscopy data. I would like to emphasize one of the largest samples, which is from Shen et al. at redshift six or so, extending also to lower luminosities. So we get information from the carbon four and magnesium two lines by fitting them in the near infrared spectrum, as well as the iron continuum. On the right, you can see an example fit of one of our spectra. This allows us to derive black hole mass estimates to measure the iron two of magnesium two flux ratio, which indicates broadline region enrichment, 
or it allows us to look into carbon-4 to magnesium-2 velocity shifts, an indicator for winds and outflows. And then we combine this information with the ALMA data. In this case, I would like to show you um, the information on the broad emission line velocity shifts with respect to the carbon-2 redshift, but other projects in the works, such as supermassive black hole galaxy co-evolution. So let's dive right in. So at first, I'd like to show you the black hole masses. So here's the bolometric luminosity black hole mass plane with our sample again highlighted in solid orange points. So these black hole masses span a range of a few times 10 to the 8 to up to 10 to the 10 solar masses with a few outliers up here. So these have adding to luminosity ratios between 0.14 to 1.46, which indicates high accretion rates. So these results reinforce the picture in which massive and highly accreting supermassive black holes are already in place in the epoch of ionization, putting strong constraints on the formation models and early growth of supermassive black holes. Furthermore, I would like to um, draw your attention to the iron enrichment in high rich of quasars. We um, try to constrain this with the iron 2 of a magnesium 2 flux ratio, which is a proxy for the iron of magnesium abundance ratio. Since the um, iron and magnesium is polluted into the ISM with a time delay of about 0.2 to 0.8 gigas, depending on the stellar and binary evolution processes, we would expect that nascent galaxies experiencing the first burst of star formation would be first enriched in magnesium 2 before they are enriched in iron. So the flux ratio, which I'm showing on this axis, is expected to drop at the very highest redshifts. However, we don't see this trend in um, in the combined sample of ours. And in fact, if we look at the median ratio, it seems to be pretty um, constant over time. So we conclude that quasars at redshift 5.8 to 7.5 have already our iron enriched broadline regions, suggesting a rapid iron enrichment in the first 0.8 giga years. And here I would like to draw your attention to this highest redshift data point um, recently published by Masafusa Onueta. From here, we move on to the carbon-4 to magnesium-2 velocity shifts. This velocity shift is seen here on the y-axis against the magnesium-2 redshift. A recent paper from last year showed the mean velocity shifts to strongly decrease at the highest redshift. So we see very large blue shifts in the carbon-4 line. Our sample also is shown in orange here. And we, if we bin our sample to the same bins as the Meyer et al data, we find extremely good agreement. This is owed to the fact that our samples overlap quite a bit. However, it so shows the consistency of our different methods. So large carbon-4 velocity blue shifts seem to be common in these high range of quasars. And we find a median of about minus 1,800 kilometers per second. So this suggests that there is a radiation-driven outflowing wind present in many of these objects. If we compare our quasars to a low redshift luminosity match sample from SDSS is shown in the gray histogram here, we can see two things. First, the median is strongly different. And secondly, even though the median is very different, we find large carbon-4 blue shifts even in the low redshift sample, leading us to conclude that low redshift analogs in volumetric and carbon-4 blue shift to these quasars do exist. At last, I would like to compare our sample with the recently published Shen et al. sample from last year, which find a discrepant carbon-4 blue shift of minus 330 kilometers per second. We've started to look into this, and it seems that part of the reason is a um, difference in the measurement methods. So with regards to these large carbon-4 blue shifts sh seen in these high redshift objects, it is still unclear whether this is a selection effect or actually a change in the broadband region conditions. So we need to further investigate this. So now I would like to come to the synergy with the ALMA data. And here I'm showing you the carbon-2 emission line compared to the broad emission lines from the quasar uh, Exhuta near our spectrum. You can see how narrow the, car uh, the carbon-2 line is, showing you that it gives us a very precise systemic redshift estimate. So we now can exploit this information by looking into the magnesium-2 to carbon-4 um, blue, a carbon-2 blue shift, excuse me. And so here's our sample, and we see or we find um, a moderately blue shifted magnesium-2 line compared to carbon-2. 
with a velocity of a median velocity of minus 390 kilometers per second. So this has already been seen in some smaller samples, as well as in lower redshift samples. So we did not stop there, but we looked at correlations between these magnesium two um, velocity shift and the carbon four velocity shift, both with respect to the host galaxies carbon two. And we found a significant correlation, which um, indicates that there is a common physical origin for these, um, for these blue shifts. We did not find any correlation with the adductor luminosity ratio, which you might um, think of at first. So with that, um, I'd like to um, conclude and summarize. So I've presented to you the extra AMA sample, which is comprised of 36 luminous reionization error quasars, which are based on AMA literature data and newly homogeneously reduced and analyzed extra near IR spectroscopy. Our goal is to get a comprehensive view on the quasar and its host galaxy, so the whole quasar phenomenon. Here are the results that I presented today, but this is um, only the start. So please stay tuned for more results coming in the future months. Thank you. All right, thanks JT. Um, questions on the, on the Slack? Um, anybody, any questions? Okay, while, while you're still typing, let me ask one first. Uh, you showed that the iron magnesium ratio is a constant and you, are you really predicting when we find redshift 10 quasars, this, uh, this trend is going to go down? So this is a bit more complicated. There is the assumption that iron, um, the iron two of magnesium two flux is a good proxy for iron over magnesium. But it has been shown in some studies that there's actually a density dependence on um, these emission lines. So it, it is a more complicated picture than I have painted here in these few minutes. Um, if this assumption holds, then we should expect this to go down. So there are some works by Samishima et al. 2017, which show some um, theoretical predictions of this. All right, thanks. Uh, other questions? Okay, so Brent Robertson asked, given the metal enrichment, can you say anything about the relative growth of the black hole and stellar components of these objects in early times? I don't think from that information we can draw any conclusions about this um, because the predicted delay times are, are not very certain. Um, but I believe, so we're, we're working on um, basically putting the um, star formation rates and black hole accretion rates in comparison for all of these quasars, as well as their, uh, the galaxy dynamical masses and the black hole masses. So we should be able to say something about their co-evolution with that. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Well, you can always continue to ask these questions um, at Slack if you have more for JT. Um, okay, thanks JT. So maybe we can move on to the next talk, which will be by Christina Alice on the, for the formation and growth of supermassive black holes. Uh, Christina, go ahead and I'll give you a two minute warning. Okay, thanks, JG. No, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you, first of all, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my research here. Uh, my name is Christina Allers, and I'm currently a postdoc at MIT, and I'd like to show you some of my work on the formation and growth of supermassive black holes in the very early universe. In the last few days, we've seen a lot of very interesting talks um, about studies that use high redshift quasar or galaxy spectra to set constraints on the intergalactic medium, on its neutral fraction, its evolution during the epoch of reionization, and so on. And I'd like to turn this question around and say, what can we actually learn about the quasars? But in order to do this, we look at how the IGM in the vicinity of a quasar responds to the ionizing radiation that the quasar emits. And so this is a radiation transfer simulation, post-process post on a cosmological simulation. 
there in the top panel, neutral gas fraction of the item as a function of um, distance from the quasar. And in the bottom panel, it shows the spectrum of the quasar as we would observe it. So the gray dashed line is the continuum emission from the quasar, but this is at redshift six. What we actually observe is for this black line. And if I now turn on the quasar, you can see the lifetime of the quasar here on the, in the blue box. You can see how the quasar starts to ionize its surroundings, the neutral gas fraction, the vicinity of the quasar decreases. And at the same time, we can observe more and more of the flux that the quasar emits. So more of the flux that is being emitted can actually be transmitted through the IGM. And so the amount of transmitted flux that we observe in the spectra of these quasars can tell us something about the lifetime. So how long have these galaxies been shining as luminous quasars? And how long have the supermassive black holes that are located in the center of these host galaxies, how long have they actively been accreting matter? Because it's really the secretion process that powers the ionizing UV radiation. And if we look at different sidelines through the hydrodynamical simulation box, we observe a clear dependency on like the amount of transmitted flux, which is here indicated by the proximity zone. So An King Chen gave a really nice introduction about that yesterday um, as a function of the, the quasar lifetime. And you can see a dependency for very um, short lifetimes. You can see this increases for very short quasar lifetimes. And then the proximity zone size like um, ceases to grow, which is once the intergalactic gas has reached ionization equilibrium with the quasar's radiation. <clears throat> and then we observe an increase in proximity zones again um, which is due to the ionization of helium-2. And we can use this S dependency now to estimate the lifetime of individual quasars. And here's just one example um, for a quasar at Ratchet 6. We measured a proximity zone, which is indicated by these red lines here. You can see where it falls in the middle panel. In this case, the proximity zone is quite small. It's only half a megaparsec. Um, we have to make sure that it's not prematurely truncated by like Lyman limit system or DLAs along the sideline. And this is the um, posterior probability distribution function for the uh, lifetime of this quasar when marginalizing over um, the proximity zone measurement. And in this case, it's actually quite small. And so we did this for a large sample of high redshift quasar spectra. And I just want to show you briefly um, how these compare to the literature one. Um, <clears throat> so what you can see here is the lifetime of these quasars as a function of, of redshift, so measured for different, um, at different redshifts. And these are all the measurements that my collaborators and I have conducted over the last few years based on this approach by looking at the proximity zones. <clears throat> and there's three things I think you can see in this plot. The first one is we're now able for the first time to actually um, measure these uh, lifetimes of the very early universe for very high redshift quasars, which was previously not or very hardly possible. Um, then most of the measurements seem to suggest that like the mean quasar lifetime is somewhere between like 10 to 6 or maybe 10 to 7 years or something like that. And there's a population of very young quasars present in the early universe, which has not been detected previously yet. And we estimate that as about 5 to 10 percent of the quasar population at large and these are in, at these early cosmic times that show these very short lifetimes of only about 10,000 years old. So what consequences do these results have on um, this growth of supermassive black holes? Well, in a simple um, model, we can assume that the black holes grow exponentially, starting from some initial black hole seed mass um, during the lifetime of the quasar. So while the galaxy shines as a luminous quasar. And this growth happens on a characteristic time scale, which is called the Salpeter time scale or E folding time scale, which is about 45 mega years if you assume that the quasar is shining at the Eddington luminosity and with a radiative efficiency of about 10%, which is the um, fiducial parameter that you get from accretion disk models. And you need about 16 of these E-folding times to grow a billion solar mass black hole from a stellar remnant initial seed, which is orders of magnitude longer than the quasar lifetimes that we measure. So to illustrate this problem a bit more clearly, if we look at the black holes in the center of some of the most distant quasars that we know today, they all host about billion solar mass black holes. If you now assume that they have been growing exponentially um, at the Eddington limit throughout the whole Hubble time, you can calculate back what the size of the black hole seeds must have been by the time they started growing. And then there's various theories that predict these initial black hole seeds with a range of different masses. 
And so at the moment, this all looks consistent, but if we now reduce the lifetime of these quasars to only like 10 to six or 10 to seven years, you can see the age here, um, which, is, which is the, the average estimate that we obtain for the quasar population at large from our proximity zone measurements, you can see that there's almost no time for these objects to grow a billion solar mass black hole under the current assumptions. And so clearly um, the current model is not really working well with those results and we have to make some adjustments. Okay, so what could be going on? Well, first our results might provide evidence for very massive initial seeds from inst for instance, from um, Zara Kolob's black holes or primordial black holes rather than stellar remnants. Another option is that maybe quasars have multiple epochs of black hole growth, so they can flicker on and off and quiescent galaxy phases would alternate with the luminous quasar phases during, during which the black hole growth is happening. So basically saying the duty cycle is much longer in the lifetime. Um, we could have obscured quasar growth phases um, where the radiation from the, the UV radiation from the accretion disk is obscured by dust. Or we could have very radiatively inefficient accretion, which is often slightly confusingly called super Eddington accretion. Um, and this would reduce the cell P to time and we could indeed grow a supermassive black hole in very short amount of time. And we have reasons to believe that while these first two options they can alleviate the tension a little bit between the lifetime that we observe and the mass that needs to be accreted to in that time onto the black hole. They cannot account for the complete discrepancy that we observe. But these last two ideas, we believe are very promising to explain the rapid growth of supermassive black holes in the very early universe. And young quasars that we discovered, or the quasars with these small proximity zones, now present a unique opportunity to actually testing these hypotheses. And in the last few minutes, I want to show you just one of our ideas on how we're planning to test these hypotheses in the future. So I mentioned um, that on one hand side, our results can be explained by radiatively inefficient accretion, implying that we can actually grow a black hole much faster than expected from accretion disk models. So more of the accreted mass ends up being um, on the black hole and thus is being radiated away. Um, and this implies that these young quasars or the quasars with the short proximity zones that we see recently observed a change in the accretion rate. So the quasar that we observed today could have been a quiescent galaxy just like 10 to four, 10 to five years before our observations. On the other hand, the quasar could have been shining and growing its black hole for a much longer time, but it was just obscured along our sideline until like 10 to the four or so years ago then the, the obscuring clouds moved away and we would observe a quasar as if it were young, but because, because the UV radiation along the light sign, light sight line was blocked. But in reality, this quasar has been emitting ionizing radiation and, and accreting mass onto black hole for a much longer time. And these two scenarios result, as I said, in like a very similar um, spectrum, namely showing a small proximity zone but the emission perpendicular to the line of sight would be different in, um, or in the transverse direction would be very different. So in one case, it would be extended if the quasar has been shining in, a much, in, um, in the unobscured direction for a longer time, whereas it would be truncated if the quasar would actually have just turned on. And this is something that we believe we can actually observe um, in the future. And so uh, if we look at the surface brightness profile of the extended nebular emission lines around these young quasars or these quasars with small proximity zones. Um, in one case, they would be more extended if we actually have obscuration happening, or in the other case, it would be, um, it would be truncated if, um, if the quasar has actually just turned on. And either case would actually be really interesting because if that's the, if that's the case, there's actually a significant fraction of black hole growth that should happen in the UV obscured phases, dust and shrouded phases, and there should be a large fraction of obscured quasars in the high redshift universe. Whereas on the other hand, if the profile is truncated, that implies that the quasars are actually young, their nuclear activity has just started, and that provides opportunities to now study the triggering mechanisms, what determines when a galaxy transitions into the active luminous quasar phase, is that caused by merger? Where does the fueling material come from? Are they strong in an outflows and so on? And we have some reason to believe that this latter scenario is actually what's happening because we have some um, data 
from Muse on the VLT, where we looked at 30 quasars at high redshift, and then we subtract the PSF, and basically what remains is the extended emission. And from these 30 quasars, we have three that show um, these small proximity zones. And interestingly, none of them shows any extended emission. However, um, these observations are, or part of them are really shallow. So it could just be that we're like below the surface brightness limit. And so in the future, we want to do this from space where we can get higher resolution data. So that means we can resolve the emission closer to the quasar. And most importantly, we have access to infrared emission lines and not just to Lyman alpha. And um, I'm just gonna leave up my summary and thank everyone for listening. All right, thanks, Christina. Um, there are a few questions in the, um, on Slack. Let me start with uh, one. You mentioned Lyman limit system. But how do you rule out that quasar near zone is set by a nearby by a nearby Lyman limit system in the data? Right. Um, yeah. So uh, we have to rule them out because, well, first of all, Wang Chengting gave a really nice talk yesterday, um, where she said that like if they are truncated, um, it like it can pretend like it's a it, it has a small proximity zone, but the quasars are actually older in real life. The way we're doing this is, I think I have a plot here. Um, the best we can basically. So we are putting an absorption or a hypothetical absorption system at the end of the proximity zone. And we search for whether, if there were a hypo an absorption system, whether we would see any of the low ionization um, metal lines that would could be associated with the system. And so you can see that in this bottom panel here where we look at silicon two and O1 and so on, and just search whether around this line or around this um, hypothetical absorption system, we see any evidence for um, metal lines. This is the stack and you can see like, um, well, there's not really any other evidence. However, we cannot rule out very metal poor systems. And so the second um, experiment we're trying to do is look at the Lyman series um, forest, because if there would really be um, a self-shielding dense absorption system, it should be line blank. It should be um, like absorbing all flux in the forest. So not only in Lyman alpha, but also in the Lyman series. And then sometimes we see some flux in that area and then we can set a limit uh, on the column density. And yeah, so we're trying to rule that out as best as we can basically. All right, thanks. Well, actually the next question came from Huan Qing. Uh, how are the ages of the individual rest of three quasars matters? At redshift three is yeah. um, it's the helium to Lyman alpha forest. So is we're looking at the yeah at the the okay. helium two. Right. Another question: Have you looked into the impact of mergers on the growth of supermassive black holes? Yeah. Um, so I haven't personally, but um, we know that they don't play like they happen, but they can't account for the majority of the black hole growth. So, um, and you can, there's actually a paper that just came out recently with Fabio Pacucci, and they looked at, basically what they're doing is um, they look at the quasar luminosity function, because the idea is that um, the uh, emission from the, from the quasar can be directly translated into accreted mass. Um, and they look at merger trees um, from hierarchical assembly model and they compare that. And they, um, the solution is that in most of the black hole growth throughout the history of the universe, it, um, accretion is the dominant process, um, apart from very high redshifts and very low masses. So at the very, very low mass end, so 10 to four solar masses or so, there's a lot of mergers happening, but they can't account for the bigger part of it. All right. Just one last question. Uh, so I had asked, can you comment on the radio transfer models that you're using to estimate quasar lifetime? Yeah, so these are the models that are based on uh, Fred Davies paper from 2016. Um, so it's post-processing, is a 1D post-processing that just takes heating and cooling into account and is on top of the hydrodynamical mix simulation. Um, yeah, I think. That's the main info, but I can add some more in the Slack. All right, thanks. So there are still many questions on Slack and we can uh, discuss those later. Let's move on. So Laura, can you uh, share the screen? Thanks, Christina.
Yeah, all right. Yep. All right. So next we have Laura Pritchard, spectroscopy confirmation of escaping, um, sorry, escaping ionizing flux from individual high redshift galaxies. Okay, can you see and hear me okay? Yeah, Laura, please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much to the organizers for putting on a great conference and also to the other speakers for their excellent talks and beautiful slides. I've learned a lot this week. I'm Laura Pritchard. I'm a postdoc at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I work with Mark Rafalski there and Jeff Cookie and others at Swinburne in Melbourne. This project, oh, it is. This project focuses on the identification of galaxies like these that emit ionizing UV radiation. These high redshift star forming galaxies likely played the biggest role in cosmic reionization, transforming it from neutral to almost completely ionized at redshifts greater than six. In this figure, you see a central star forming galaxy outflowing ionizing radiation and neutral clouds of material that surround the galaxy. Any ionizing photon that escapes from the galaxy is often called a Lyman continuum photon because it's emitted at far ultraviolet wavelengths below the Lyman break, which is at 912 angstroms. These ionizing photons are rapidly hoovered up by any neutral material. And as such, at redshifts greater than five, the inter intergalactic medium in the universe was so dense that it actually acts as an opaque veil to this radiation, which obscures our view of cosmic reionization. So while we can't look back to cosmic reionization itself, we can look back to galaxies very close in time and properties between a redshift of three and five. However, this is not an easy task. First, you, first, the ionizing photon has to escape the galaxy itself. It then has to travel across most of the age of the universe without coming into contact with any neutral material until we can observe it at Earth. So while these are our best hope of placing observational constraints on cosmic reionization, this is an incredibly elusive population of galaxies that poses many observational challenges. And there has been a string of bad luck or false or not widely accepted detections as a result. As such, to date, there are still only a handful of individual spectroscopic Lyman continuum detections from galaxies. So how do we go about searching for these Lyman continuum galaxies? This plot shows a standard Lyman break galaxy spectrum. This is a typical high redshift star forming galaxy spectrum. And you can see it shows the signature Lyman break below 912 angstroms where all the ionizing photons are absorbed. It has strong Lyman alpha emission and it also has a Barman break around 4000 angstroms. Overlaid over the top are photometric bands. These are actually the Hubble Space Telescope bands used in the candle survey, and they span from rest far ultraviolet through to near infrared wavelengths. An incredibly powerful technique for getting redshifts for distant galaxies is something called the Lyman break technique. Instead of relying on observationally expensive spectroscopy, you can instead rely on multiband images to find distant galaxies at these high redshifts. So in this video, you'll see the spectrum moving with redshift and we'll zoom in on galaxies that fall out of these bands. As, the, uh, as we go to higher redshifts, the Lyman limit moves and the bands that the galaxies drop out of allows us to get approximate redshifts for the, for the galaxies. This is the powerful principle behind the Lyman break technique and it's led to the discovery of the highest redshift galaxies that we know about. The bands shown in the video are the Hubble, Hubble bands F275W, F336W and F435W. So with these bands, you can cleanly span below the Lyman limit at redshifts greater than 2.4, 3.1 and 4.4 respectively. Therefore, with these bands, you can span these crucial redshifts that lead you up to this observable limit of the far ultraviolet at redshifts of five. An important question to ask though, is if you add flux to the spectrum below the Lyman break, is it always identifiable as a Lyman break galaxy? In other words, do Lyman break galaxy selections sometimes miss Lyman continuum galaxies? To identify a Lyman continuum galaxy, you need two bits of information. You need the redshift and a method of measuring leaking Lyman continuum flux. So one way to really test this is to identify a population of distant galaxies without relying on the Lyman break technique for their redshifts. My collaborator, Joris Mestrick, recently published a, a comprehensive search of spectroscopic redshifts in the cosmos field, so without relying on the Lyman break technique, although it's important to note that often spectroscopic redshifts have biases themselves. Targets are often pre-selected with the Lyman break technique. 
Um, with clouds U-band imaging, which is ground-based to detect leaking line and continuum flux and optical high-resolution HST imaging for um, finding um, low redshift contaminants, Yorosh was actually able to identify two new Lyman continuum uh, galaxies and three promising candidates using this more agnostic approach. In this work, to identify a population of Lyman continuum galaxies in a less biased way, we've again targeted the cosmos field. Cosmos is there covered by 30 bands, um, 30 band imaging, including deep, medium, IR, four star bands. And these were used in the Z-Forge survey for determining photometric redshifts. Z-Forge is the ideal survey for this, as these medium bands actually span the Barmer break, as you can see in the image on the right, rather than relying on the Lyman break that these galaxies may not have. This results in very accurate redshifts, errors less than 2% and minimal catastrophic errors. So we have a field and a method of accurate redshifts. All that's needed is the efficient detection of leaking Lyman continuum flux. For this, we have deep HST images that probe this, um, the rest FUV at redshifts greater than 3.1 and 4.4 for F336W and F435W respectively. You can see these four untargeted um, pointings in the large cosmos footprint on the left. We're in the regime that every pixel counts to identify these often very faint ionizing sources. And for that reason, I've made several improvements to the Wide Field Camera 3 UVIS production pipeline to clean these images up far beyond what's publicly available from MAST. So I'll mostly let the images speak for themselves and just touch on a few of the main highlights of my new reduction pipeline. But please reach out to me via Slack or email if you would like to clean up your Wide Field Camera 3 UVIS images. All of the codes for this are public um, and I'll be happy to help. I'm part of the UV Candles collaboration and run all the custom reductions for that survey. So here's an example of my improvements that were used by another program. This is a nearby spiral galaxy. The masked image is shown on the left um, and the image with my custom calibrations is shown on the right. You'll see that there are gradients and also offsets between four quadrants, which are smoothed out. And on the pixel level, there are divots and also um, blotchy patterns that are caused by poor quality darks um, that make identifying faint objects very challenging. And this has all been resolved in my new custom reduction. So the, these improvements have taken a long time, a lot of work and testing, and is usually the way with um, data reduction, people usually don't want to hear about the details. So luckily for you, Space Telescope is actually now implementing all of my improvements to the DARKS pipeline as standard. Therefore, much improved, reduced data will be available for download directly from MAST soon. But for help applying any additional corrections, please do get in touch. So back to the science, myself and my collaborators visually inspected all 400 objects um, in the newly reduced images that were the redshift range such that they would pick up ionizing radiation. The high resolution of the HST images helps us to identify any low redshift contaminants. So did this less biased approach actually work for identifying Lyman continuum galaxies? Here's one of our Lyman continuum candidates. Here I'm showing the same galaxy in three, three different wavelengths in these three images. So we've got the far ultraviolet on the left where you can actually see some leaking Lyman continuum flux through to optical and near infrared on the right. However, to truly determine the nature of these targets, we have to get spectroscopic follow-up to confirm their Z-forge redshifts. And in January of this year, we got Keck Arrow spectroscopy for some of our Lyman continuum candidates, and I'll show you some of those exciting preliminary results today. So here I'm just smoothing the HST image to make that Lyman continuum Im uh, image a bit clearer. The Arrow spectrum here is shown in grey. The Lyman break there's a Lyman break galaxy stack spectrum which is shown over the top in blue, and the yellow show positions of skylines where the flux should be ignored. This galaxy was spectroscopically confirmed at redshift 4.37, so very close to the Z-Forge redshift, with emission and absorption features as shown. As you can see in the Lyman break galaxy stack, there's actually no flux bluewood of the Lyman limit, and this in our l spectrum, you can see that there is leaking Lyman continuum flux for this galaxy. Here's um, another one of our targets. This is a redshift uh, 4.48 that was confirmed. So again, if we just smooth the Lyman continuum image, it becomes a bit clearer. Here I'm showing just the red side of the spectrum. We're still working on reducing the blue side. The red end of the spectrum, however, still allows us to get a redshift for this galaxy, confirming that the flux that we see in the HST image is genuine leaking Lyman continuum flux. So from our photometric search, we found eight good quality candidates and 12 others. And this represents a 5% detection rate in the F336W images, which is significant. 
And from our spectroscopic follow-up, we're able to confirm four new individual Lyman continuum galaxies in just those four untargeted uh, pointings in the cosmos field. The work presented today presents, uh, is a, serves as a successful pilot study for the method, but I should emphasize that this work is incredibly challenging. It requires both deep UV HST imaging and ground-based spectroscopy. The UV candle survey is a vast HST program that will provide UV coverage of four of the five candles fields, and it's over 98% complete already. While these images are shallower than our pilot, the area covered is 10 times larger. Our pilot study has shown that spectroscopic follow-up is essential to confirm the selected targets that we find in the photometry. And I was recently awarded 1.5 nights of NASA Keck time to follow up uh, photometrically selected can uh, UV candles targets in Cosmos. And our estimates show that we could get tens of spectroscopic confirmations. This method provides a way to identify Lyman continuum galaxies at redshifts where we can actually observe the ionizing flux leaking. We can therefore build up a statistical, a stati statistically significant sample of Lyman continuum leakers in order to observationally constrain um, cosmic reionization. And I'll just leave it there with my future work. Thanks so much. All right, I think, um, questions. Okay, so a few questions come in, in uh, Slack. First, Henry Ferguson asked, do you have estimates of the Lyman continuum exact fraction for the galaxies you will detect correcting for IgM attenuation? Um, we will, we'll be getting those at the moment. So as I mentioned briefly, the, the work on the images has taken a long time. And for anyone who's worked in the UV in photometry knows that UV photometry can be very challenging. For example, getting PSFs and also knowing what isophotes to extract uh, the, um, the flux from. So that's all being done kind of in parallel with UV candles, but I'm looking forward to really being able to hone in on the escape fractions. Some preliminary results show that it could be between five and 10% for our targets, um, but I, th those are not well fleshed out, but we have um, simulations for proper uh, treatment of the IGM attenu attenuation, for example. So we're gonna, we're gonna give them a proper estimate. Uh, the next question is sort of related. Rohan asks, how transparent must IGM sideline be at ratio 4.8 for the attack memory limit for the source based on the simulation? It should be pretty opaque. Uh, great question. It From uh, Joros Mestrick's work, actually, he found that you really have to have the most transparent lines through the IGM in order to be able to detect these galaxies. So that further complicates inferring physical properties from the Lyman continuum galaxies that we detect because we're biased to the cleanest lines of sight. Um, but it's, it's something that I'll, I'll be looking at with this sample, but certainly we're kind of, we're biased towards the ones that we can see the clearest. Thanks. Uh, next question is about, can you root out AGN activities? In the uh, yeah, we'll, yeah we'll, we'll be, we'll be cross-referencing with all AGN catalogs, but um, certainly for these galaxies, I'm pretty sure uh, these don't have AGN. And then, but I, I need to double check. Um, but yeah, the, we'll, we'll definitely be, be cross-referencing all catalogs to make sure that these are genuine uh, detections of leaking line continuum flux from galaxies rather than AGN. All right, thanks. Uh, next question is, is the surface brightness you see in the lemon continuum image consistent with being smooth given the signal noise, or do you require the leak um, emission to be patchy? Um, it's, it's actually, it's an in interesting question. Each of these sources is incredibly different. So sometimes the emission comes, uh, it, it looks patchy. Sometimes it looks offset. Sometimes it looks very compact and centered really on the galaxy. So um, it's definitely a diverse collection and, and we'll be looking into the morphology of these sources for sure. All right, let's do one more. Uh, can you say anything about the presence of increasing flux from the REST 911 and a short word, which would be a signature of um, be the signature of a lemon continuum drop ins. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm, I'm, but... I'm not sure I understand the question either, actually. Uh, let I me read it again. I can, I can go to Slack and, and have a and sure. ask for clarification. But thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess we should move on. Uh, so next we have uh, Rohan Nadu. He's probably going to tell us why reionization is caused by these uh, massive galaxies, high redshift. Rohan, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. And uh, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, my name is Rohan Naidu. I'm a graduate student at Harvard University, um, advised by Charlie Conroy. I wrote my undergrad thesis with Pascal Uish, uh, and I have the great privilege to work with this uh, delightful uh, band of people. I'm very excited to share some results with you today that we uh, put out uh, a few months ago uh, about an updated picture of uh, reionization. So I know I'm uh, preaching to the choir here, uh, but even to the true believers, uh, there's, there's never a wrong time to show uh, Avi's beautiful uh, reionization graphic. Um, two of the conventional uh, pieces of wisdom that at least I was taught as an undergrad uh, a couple of years ago was that reionization is largely done by redshift six and it's mainly driven by faint star forming galaxies that are the leading candidates of reionization. But in the last few years, we've had so many really exciting developments. Uh, we've finished the first census of galaxies out of Redshift 10. Uh, we have all these exciting constraints on the IGM reionization history from all these really cool quasars and high Redshift lime and alpha emitters. Uh, tau keeps getting more and more precise with every passing year. We have all these beautiful lime and continuum measurements, some of which Laura just showed. Uh, and we also have tons of reionization simulations that really like build intuition as to what's going on and which galaxies are reionizing the universe. Um, so in this work, what we have tried to do is really unite all these uh, developments self-consistently, uh, bring them all together under the same umbrella and uh, see what they tell us about reionization. So our umbrella of choice is a very simple empirical model uh, that, we, that, that Sandro Takela built out. Um, the very simple assumption in this model is the star formation rate and growth of galaxies is intertwined with the growth of their dark matter halos. That is the very simple uh, bedrock of this model. And these halos are seeded with this redshift independent star formation efficiency that's calibrated at a redshift of four. And from there onwards, everything else is predicted. Um, for reionization, of course, we are, uh, so, so it reproduces a lot of key, observa key observables that we care about in the high redshift community, stuff like the luminosity functions, rho SFR and stuff. In the reionization game, we always uh, focus on these three key players, uh, the star formation density, the ionizing photon production efficiency and the escape fraction, how many of these ionizing photons are actually making it out into the intergalactic medium to reionize them. One thing I'd like you to draw, one thing I'd like you to pay attention to is um, in this particular figure of the evolution of rho SFR, uh, our model really uh, very naturally reproduces this sharp drop in the star formation density uh, at high redshifts and that'll become important in a second. Uh, the psi ion is consistent with what we think are the best observations that we currently have. And as the escape fraction is a key unknown. So the idea is to keep all this other stuff fixed and let F escape float and see what we learn from all these latest constraints. So to cut to the chase, um, we find an escape fraction of about 20-ish percent is what all these constraints together along with the constraints from our empirical model itself. Remember, we uh, let the halos evolve after tuning only that star formation efficiency. So everything else is a self-consistent um, prediction from the model. Uh, yeah, so we get out this escape fraction of 20-ish percent. Uh, the most constraining uh, constraints turn out to be the Lyman alpha damping wing, the quasar damping wing, uh, and the requirement that uh, reionization is mostly done by around redshift of 5.9-ish. The reionization picture that is suggested by all this is a really rapid reionization. Um, so you go from the universe uh, being almost completely neutral at redshift 8-ish to being completely reionized by redshift 6-ish, right? So that's only about 300 mega years. There are about there are five solar mass B type stars whose, whose age is about 300 mega years, the, the time they spend on the main sequence lifetime to just give you a sense of how rapid we're talking. 
um, about. And since we put out this paper, there's just been more and more growing evidence that reionization really is indeed super rapid. There's new constraints from the KSZ effect. Uh, there's new constraints from the Lyman beta uh, fractions that, that Ginny showed yesterday. There's more redshift seven quasars that also suggest this. Um, and while reionization is late, remember that it's still patchy. So you still have certain sight lines along which you are fairly transparent. So is this 20% escape fraction, the one single parameter that we really move around in our, in our simple model, uh, is this 20% average escape fraction a reasonable uh, number? And it seems that the emerging picture really in the last like few years really is that around redshift two, three, you can really get up to about 10-ish percent. So the question then that we really wanted to answer with our model was how do you go from basically 0% escape fractions in the local universe to about 10% at redshift three, and then 20% at these higher redshifts in a, in a very self-consistent manner. So one uh, solution that, that suggested itself just by looking at these uh, Lyman continuum leaking detections is that most of them tend to be really, really compact and have very high star formation surface density. So the amount of star formation being compressed in a very small area. And there's also like a lot of motivation from this new generation of reionization simulations that the way you get to high escape fractions is by really like carving out channels in the ISM through feedback on very small scales. So just by linking uh, the escape fraction to star formation surface density, we once again throw this whole kitchen sink of constraints against our model um, and see what falls out. What falls out is a fairly similar, uh, really rapid uh, reionization history, but the ionizing budget is very different. Uh, the galaxies that are doing the bulk of reionization are actually a very small handful. So here I'm plotting how sigma is changing as a function of stellar mass at reach of seven that we believe is the heart of reionization. And you see the escape fractions are really being driven by these very compact galaxies at uh, masses of mostly greater than 10 power eight. So the picture that falls out of this is that uh, about 80% of the reionization budget is controlled by really this small handful of galaxies. You see, so these galaxies are dominating reionization, but they're very, very rare uh, compared to the bulk of the population. Um, so this is a highly unequal society. It's a society of a very high Gini coefficient. The reionization budget is not equally distributed. And these kind of like very compact high sigma galaxies become more and more common towards higher redshifts. So it very neatly explains why you get a small escape fraction at around redshift of zero, which grows towards higher redshifts. So then what about the conventional picture? The conventional picture of, you know, like this massive reservoir of very faint galaxies that are super abundant during the bulk of reionization. So I show one such model here, which, very, uh, which is super helpful to think about this problem, right? where the escape fraction goes inversely to the halo mass, uh, Finkelstein 2019, where the reionization that you get is much more smooth and starts very early, right? Which these constraints and all, a lot, a lot, the other constraints that I outlined uh, seem to disfavor. And I've tried to summarize this, uh, this picture in this cartoon where, where if you have these very faint galaxies contribute too much too early, you end up reionizing the universe very early. So we've, made, we've done a very brave thing here, right? You're saying the bright galaxies are doing all this work. Bright galaxies that are currently observable, uh, MUV less than minus 18 galaxies. Uh, so there's tons of tests that one can, um, one can look at to figure out whether this hypothesis holds or not. Uh, one interesting uh, simulation that recently came out from Fire 2, and I think uh, Shang Cheng is gonna talk more about it, uh, really supports the same picture of, you know, uh, the escape fraction here as a function of stellar mass really seems to favor more massive galaxies, especially in the higher resolution simulations. Um, another simple test is a very direct one. Uh, we're constructing these stacks of redshift two to three Lyman continuum leakers. You just stack the high sigma ones uh, and you see that the detection really is in the high sigma sources uh, compared to the lower sigma ones. Um, another test is just by directly looking for the oligarchs at very high redshifts, right? And we've heard a lot about Kolavan and some of these other double peak 
uh, lyman alpha emitters that are likely like powering their own bubbles uh, without any assistance from like some of these fainter galaxies around them. Another less glamorous thing to do, but uh, something that I really encourage the community to do would be to focus at lower redshifts, but try to get very resolved uh, Lyman alpha profiles along with systemic redshifts that can help us uh, discern whether they really are uh, leaking, escape, uh, leaking with high escape fractions. Um, the Alpine survey has a very promising result on this front where they show that the Lyman alpha offset compared to the systemic seems to really be going down as you go to higher and higher redshifts, but you need high resolution data to really confirm that. Uh, similarly, we are leading, uh, Charlotte Mason is leading this uh, wonderful survey at the CFA where we are trying to get these super high resolution lemon alpha profiles to figure out what's going on. Um, then there's ten, tons of other tests with upcoming facilities, 21 centimeter maps should really nail this. Uh, absorption line spectroscopy would be very helpful as well uh, by getting the covering fractions. Very happy to hear your ideas. Um, and I'll end with this uh, summary. Thank you so much for listening to me. And it's really been a privilege to be part of this conference, hanging out on the chat with so many of my idols and people that I look up to. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I'll take questions. All right. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Uh, so they have some questions on the Slack already. The first question is, is there a way you can quantify the degeneracy between the F escape constraints you get and other parameters, for example, the average faint and slope of luminosity function in the problem. Right. So in this particular model, of course, the only thing we are varying, the only like free parameter we are leaving is the is the escape fraction. But um, this this uh, plot does cast some light on um, on how that degeneracy might work. Um, where when you truncate. Um, at lower and lower MUV, uh, you need to ensure you don't reionize too much of the universe too early. So here I'm just like, you know, doing a theoretical kind of calculation where I just assume some faint end slopes, uh, a very like reasonable um, set of parameters and see what falls out in, this, in the same space with these same constraints. Um, and I expect the space to shrink even more once we add the new constraints I talked about earlier. All right, thanks. Uh, the next question is, what faint and slope do you get from a UV mouse function anyway? Is that comparable with recent observations? Uh, so the model predicts uh, faint and slopes that really are uh, very much in line with uh, the observations, right? So here is the redshift six UVLF. Um, and in purple is shown what our model predicts and it seems to be in the thick of the data points. Even more formally, uh, just looking at chi-square values, it seems like we're we are doing okay. Uh, the only significant disagreement actually is on the bright end uh, with these points from Attic et al, where we are uh, uh, disagreeing slightly. Uh, thanks. Uh, there's an anonymous question. Uh, there are indication that some galaxies have very low escape fraction, for example, from the fast, uh, from the fast GRB holes, like, while others have very high escape fraction. What Include, would, would including this scatter affect your results? Um, so I'll point out that there is a lot of scatter that just falls out of the model itself, right? Like, so there's a huge diversity in sigma. Um, so, so I'm not just saying massive galaxies are doing it, right? Like in this model, it's the more massive galaxies that are also very compact and also very star farming that are doing it. So there's a lot of scatter that falls out of sigma itself. Um, as for lower redshifts, when you go to lower and lower redshifts where a lot of these constraints are available, things get more complicated because of uh, stuff like dust. Um, and, and, and yeah, so like in our model, at least at redshift uh, four-ish, uh, three-ish, where a lot of these new constraints are coming in, we expect escape fractions of about 10-ish percent on average, but this is interesting, right? The fraction at F escape greater than 0.2 is really small. Um, so it very much is, consi is consistent with this picture of there's a very small fraction of galaxies which have high F escape um, and the mean is also low at lower redshifts. This pink line in particular is illustrative. All right, uh, I have quite time probably for one last question. Uh, does your model with 20% F escape naturally reproduce the flat slope of the background Bolton ionizing emissivity measurement in redshift five to three? 
Ah, that's a really uh, that's a really cool uh, question. Um, so in the paper, we do show that like um, we satisfy that. I don't have a plot right away for it, but we have a plot of um, n ion versus z. Um, and at redshift four-ish, so, so remember that our model is uh, really a model for the high redshift universe. So we calibrated at redshift four and like let it uh, do what it does for high redshifts. So extrapolating it backwards is, uh, is, is tricky, but at, at least at the higher redshifts, it does seem to uh, match the constraints from Bolton. All right, thanks. I think we should move on. So thank you. And there are a few more questions on the Slack that you can discuss later. Um, now let's move to the next talk. Luis, do you want to share a screen? Yes. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, thinking. All right. All right. So yep. now we're going to move on to uh, to actually looking at the stars who might be doing the randomization. So the next talk is about uh, carbon isotopes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Louise, and uh, I'm a PhD student at Durham University. And I'd just like to thank the organizers for creating this wonderful online space, because I have really learned a lot already. Um, and yes, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing with my supervisors, Ryan Cook and Michaeli Fumagalli, and one of our collaborators, Max Patini. And the general idea is that you can use the chemistry of near pristine systems to investigate the properties of the stars that enrich them. And not only that, but by looking at these enriching stars, uh, you can start to look at the star formation history of these very metal poor objects. And so a quick motivation for this search is that the first stars to form in the universe, these population three stars, um, uh, have never been detected despite surveys span almost four decades now. And so what we tend to do is look for the surviving chemical signature of these stars in relic objects. So if you imagine in this flow chart, there's a massive metal free star in the early universe uh, undergoing core collapse supernovae, and it's going to enrich its environment with the first instances of metals. And these metals will migrate to the uh, now chemically near pristine gas uh, and then this gas will cool and collapse and form the second generation of stars we see in the halo of the Milky Way. And so this search uh, so far that I've been working on is focusing on looking at the chemical signature of this near pristine gas. And to do that, we rely on a technique called quasar absorption line spectroscopy. So I just have a quick video showing how this technique works uh, and what you see. So we're watching light from a background quasar travel towards our telescope. And at the moment, it's going through pockets of low density gas and creating the Lyman Alpha forest. But as you approach a galaxy with a large reservoir of neutral hydrogen, you get this really distinctive absorption feature um, with these damped wings. But not only do you get absorption from the neutral hydrogen, you get absorption due to the metals that are in this gas cloud. And so this is a really key technique that we can use to look at the chemical composition of gas in the redshift interval between two and three, uh, typically because this is when these objects are most easily studied. Um, and so the DLAs themselves are quite easy to identify by these damped wings. And what we're really trying to do when we're looking for the first generation of stars and their chemical signature is to find the most metal deficient DLA possible. And these have metallicities almost a thousandth of that uh, of the sum. And for this search specifically, we've been looking for the carbon isotope ratio. And that's because simulations of stellar evolution that most stars are predominantly going to produce carbon 12. So in this plot here, I'm just showing the log of the number abundance ratio of these two isotopes as a function of the progenitor mass. And you can see that there are only two channels where we expect to produce low carbon 12 to carbon 13 ratios. And these come from either low mass population three stars that I'm showing here in purple, or intermediate mass population two stars that I'm showing here in gray. 
And so the key takeaway from this then is that if we can measure this isotope ratio in a near pristine system, we may be able to see the chemical signature of low mass population three stars or alternatively, given the distinct lifetimes of these stars, we might be able to see the time scale on which the system has been enriched. And so now I'm going to focus entirely on the carbon-2 line at 1334 angstroms, where here I'm showing you a model absorption profile for a system that has equal amounts of carbon-12 and carbon-13. And so from this figure, you can see that if you know the line center of this carbon-12 line extremely accurately, and you can start to see the presence of carbon-13 in the system as an asymmetry in the overall line profile. But to do this, you really need to pin down that, pin down that carbon-12 line uh, using the line centers of other absorption features. So it requires a really accurate wavelength solution. And thanks to Espresso, which is the shell spectrograph, for rocky exoplanets and stable spectroscopic observations, uh, this delicate measurement has now become possible thanks to its unprecedented wavelength accuracy. So at around 4,000 angstroms, the wavelength accuracy is better than 10 to the minus four angstroms. And not only that, uh, but this instrument can be employed using all four of the telescopes that make up the VLT. So you can really target these faint objects uh, which is great. So uh, we, given all this, we applied for some science verification data that came in in August of last year. And we looked specifically um, at the DLA along the line of sight to the quasar J0035 minus 0918. And that's because this system is one of the most metal poor uh, gas clouds that we know of. So it's iron to hydrogen abundance is uh, almost a thousandth that of the sun. And it's also a very quiescent system, which helps when you're trying to make this delicate measurement. So here I'm just showing you the absorption features due to some of the metals uh, in this gas cloud. But uh, if we focus on this uh, carbon-2 line, our analysis suggests uh, a distinctive lack of carbon-13. So here I'm showing the espresso data over plotted with different model profiles for different carbon-12 isotope ratios. And this bright red line here that falls at the very edge of the data uh, corresponds to our two sigma limit. So we've found that we can confidently rule out the presence of large amounts of carbon-13 in this system, but given this limit, we can't empirically rule out enrichment from low mass population three stars as of yet. But something that we can do is use the entire chemistry of this system to try and model the uh, enriching population of stars. So uh, in this equation in the top right here, uh, we're just trying to gauge the number of stars that have chemically enriched this system that formed within, within a given mass range where the stars forming a bay of power law governed by this slope alpha. And I just want to draw your attention to our estimates on the minimum mass of these enriching stars. And you can see that our estimates are quite different depending on whether you assume this system has been enriched by population two stars or population three stars. So this gray uh, posterior distribution that corresponds to enrichment from population two stars seems to suggest that there has been no enrichment from the lowest mass stars. Uh, which is quite an interesting thing. And it's something that we can use to look at the star formation history of this system, given the lifetimes of these stars. So if we look at the time when we observe the DA, we can uh, predict when the majority of stars formed in this system. And under the assumption of population two enrichment, you can see that following the epoch of reionization, there's seems to be a lack of star formation for approximately one giga year. Um, and this is uh, due to the fact we're not seeing the chemical signature of the low mass stars. Um, and so the idea here then is that we can use this tool to look at possible reionization quenching in low mass structures. And the between the quenching of star formation in this all gas cloud and 
some of the ultra faint dwarf galaxy population. And so uh, another tentative suggestion that this might be happening is that uh, there's this um, tentative trend of increasing carbon to oxygen ratios as a function of redshift, which is something that you might expect if you were seeing a delayed onset in the enrichment from low mass and intermediate mass stars following the epoch of reionization. And something that we'd love to do is pin down this measurement uh, further with some higher signal to noise data. Um, and so the formative and we've recovered the first batch on this ratio in a near pristine system using espresso. But to better investigate the enrichment of this DLA, uh, we need higher signal to noise data. And our current enrichment model suggests that the, this DLA may have experienced a hiatus in star formation at the end of reionization. So thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you could hear me okay because I got a warning saying my internet connection was unstable. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it worked. Um, okay. Questions? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Uh, questions from the Slack, please. Let, let me ask something. So, uh, how many more objects do you think you can have in recent and near future comparable to like uh, OO35? Yeah, you mean a sim system similar to this where we could try yeah, and do a similar measurement? Yeah, to try to get, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's tricky because it requires the gas cloud to be quite quiescent. So, um, the, and also for it to be metal poor, which is a rarity in itself. But we're hoping to do some follow-up observations on a further two systems um, across a range of metallicities. Um, so there's at least two more that we want to look at. And in the future, uh, certainly with the ELT, there'll be lots more. But at the moment, yeah, they're quite hard to find. All right, thanks. Uh, so Valentina is asking, very nice result. The carbon two line looks mildly saturated. Did you take that into consideration? Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, so there, um, there was some slight contamination um, with um, a, with a, a galaxy in the field with this data, but um, so we kind of had to account for that as well. But we and so we applied this zero level to the data to account for some low level contamination. Um, yeah. So I so I think before you apply that zero level, the line doesn't look saturated. Um, but that's yeah, that's a good question. I answer that better probably if I look at the data again. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, Sarah Bosman's asking, what would be the best target DLAs to conduct this measurement in terms of their metal enrichment ratios? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, that's a good question. So one of the things, one of the reasons we picked them initially is because it had enhanced carbon uh, compared to the solar value. And that's something that you see in the population two stars that are most likely descended uh, from the first stars. So uh, ideally we would target things with high carbon ratios um, and also very low oxygen to hydrogen abundances. That would be ideal, yeah. But, and, and in the future, if we start detecting DLAs with iron to hydrogen that are less than minus three, um, those would be perfect, as long as they weren't really turbulent. All right, the next question is, can you do something similar in low metallicity stars? Oh, um, so you can certainly look at the chemical enrichment uh, with this model of uh, stars, yeah. Right, which is something that I'm working on now. Um, yeah. But then I think um, you would you can only do that with population two stars. So you'd cut, you may get a bound on the minimum mass of the population three stars. Yeah, this could, uh, <laughs> so you can use this analysis certainly um, on stars, which we're trying to do now, but whether you can use it for looking at, I mean, it wouldn't, it's not applicable to look at enrichment histories, I don't think off the top of my head. 
All right, let's do one more. So John Weiss is asking, what are the difficulties of looking at lambda limit systems for similar or a lack of features from publishing state stars? Yeah, so Lyman limit, it would be great to look at Lyman limit systems too, because then you open yourself up to a lot more data. Yeah, but the the problem with those systems is that because um, they have slightly lower column densities, they are sometimes they're more affected by uh, ionization. Uh, so you can kind of, uh, trust if you have a sufficiently large column density of hydrogen that your elements are gonna uh, reside in like a single dominant ionization state but as your column density goes down in, like with these Lyman limit systems uh, that's a hot you have to start to think about applying ionization corrections to your abundances all right thank you okay so I think we should move on uh, thanks. thanks Luis for the talk and um, Anna can you share your screen of course thank you all right, so our last talk before the break is uh, from Anna Schurer about the formation of the first stars in the universe. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, so also thank you from me uh, for letting me speak here at this wonderful online conference. Um, I'm Anna Schauer, I'm a postdoc at UT Austin, and I'd like to share some results from my simulations as well as um, from uh, some semi-analytical work that we did very recently. So when we look at the time evolution of the universe, we can observe the cosmic microwave background at a redshift of over a thousand. And then we have this big gap in time until we can observe the first galaxy at a redshift 11 um, or the first black hole at roughly a redshift of seven. The first stars, however, form in a redshift range of roughly 30 to 10. So with James Webb, we will be able to target this region. However, James Webb will not be able to see um, a single population of population D stars because um, it's not, they are not luminous. They sit in tiny halos that I will show you later. So what we do or what I do is I run computer simulations and I do theoretical modeling um, to understand better when the first stars of the universe formed. So here I show you the a number density slice of my simulation at uh, Redshift 15. So I run simulations with the code Arepo it's a moving mesh coat. Um, I have dark matter, I have gas, um, and I also have primordial chemistry included, uh, which uh, mainly contains molecular hydrogen. That's uh, a very important molecule because it's the one way we can cool uh, a mini halo down to temperatures below the atomic cooling limit. So it really is the way to jump from the temperature of 10,000 Kelvin to roughly 200. My simulations are one megaparsec uh, in box size. Uh, run from a redshift of 200 down to a redshift of 14 um, and the strength of it are the resolution. So I have a resolution in dark matter of roughly 100 solar masses and then gas of roughly 20 solar masses. So when I now look for the first uh, objects, the first teeny tiny galaxies, so-called mini halos, in which those stars are forming, um, I can find many hundreds of those objects and they are nicely resolved. Um, and I show you here um, a zoom in into one of those uh, small mini halos. You can see it's like a very filamentary structure and we have a high density core here. And those objects typically have masses of a few times 10 to the five to uh, 10 to the seven solar masses. And uh, like this picture is a zoom in, but my simulation is not a zoom simulation. So I have a uniform uh, mass resolution throughout the whole uh, simulation. Uh, which is nice because I can then resolve my mini halos. For studying the really early universe, we need to go back a little bit and I need to talk about an effect that's very important for the first stars um, and that dates back to before recombination. Those are the so-called streaming velocities. So at those very, very early times in the universe, um, the universe is very dense and very hot. Uh, so we have this coupling of our photons to the gas. On the right, I show you a cartoonish picture on a very large scale. So we have dark matter in dark and we have um, gas in blue. And we can see that here in this region of the universe, a dark matter uh, over density is growing. The gas doesn't follow that because when the dark matter can fall into its own potential wall and increase, um, uh, the, the gas, however, um, is pushed outwards from the pressure. 
So we do have a velocity offset in some regions of the universe um, between the gas and the dark matter before recombination. Um, and you can see that some of the regions of the universe have a large velocity offset. For example, here in the region I'm pointing out with my mouse here uh, next to the center, uh, whereas in other regions over here, um, we don't have a really big velocity offset um, and the gas and the um, dark matter are moving uniformly. So moving to large scales, we can see that we have regions of the universe where we are synchronization between um, gas and dark matter and in other regions of the universe, we are have a large offset velocity. How big is this offset velocity? At recombinations, it's 30 kilometers per second. Um, then as the universe expands, the velocity gets smaller. So a typical um, first star formation redshift of 20, it's about half a kilometer per second as it is decaying. And here you can see like on how large scales um, this uh, velocity difference plays a role. So this is 400 megaparsec. And what we do with our simulations, because they're just one megaparsec big, we can now run different simulations in different spots of our larger scale. And what we do is we artificially insert a streaming velocity into our initial conditions. So what we do is we have the same initial conditions, but then um, introduce an additional velocity in X direction to mimic those different streaming velocity regions. And we can do that because our box is relatively small compared to this coherent length of uh, three megaparsec. So let me now show you my slice again at the redshift of 15 for the simulation I showed you before with no streaming velocity. So where um, we don't have an artificial or an additional offset velocity between dark matter and baryons. And let me now move through my um, streaming velocity values of higher streaming velocities. And as you see, this image gets more blurry. I didn't change the technique, how I produced this picture. This is really the physical effect that we see when the gas is moving with a high relative velocity with respect to the dark matter. Um, that structure formation um, in the gas um, is delayed. So having the same picture here um, on the left, as I showed you before in those four slides, and then having zoom ins uh, for 20 kiloparsec and then two kiloparsec, what we can see is those streaming velocities, they wash out uh, the structure in the gas. Um, the maximum density uh, decreases that we can reach in the gas. And this of course has an effect on star formation um, because stars ultimately form out of the dense um, gas. And if uh, our dense gas isn't present in a galaxy or in a mini halo, then we cannot form stars there. So where we can still form stars is when we move to larger halos. So with larger halos, they have a larger potential and they can attract, still attract gas. And those larger halos form large later in the universe due to hierarchical structure formation. So overall streaming velocities delay star formation. Streaming velocities delay star formation uh, in the early universe. We now need to in take into account also a second effect, the so-called Lyman-Werner radiation. That's a feedback effect. Um, the first stars emit radiation and they also emit it in the wavelength in the energy range of 11.2 to 13.6 EV, um, which is the range that destroys molecular hydrogen. And when we don't have molecular hydrogen, we lose our coolant. So again, I show you simulation boxes um, with no Lyman-Werner background a weak Lyman-Werner background and a strong Lyman-Werner background. And with no Lyman-Werner background, what you can see is that um, the low density regions in between the filaments do have molecular hydrogen and that completely disappears when we have a Lyman-Werner background present. In our halos, so zooming in again to 20 kiloparsec and then two ki kiloparsec, we see that we still retain molecular hydrogen less so with a stronger Lyman-Werner background um, because Lyman-Werner uh, radiation can be self-shielded by molecular hydrogen. So as soon as we have a big enough halo um, with enough gas, um, molecular hydrogen can self-shield in that halo. And in those cases, star formation is still possible because the gas can still cool and become very dense in the center. But we again need to move to larger halos 
um, and therefore um, star formation generally is suppressed. And because those larger halos form later in the universe, star formation is also delayed. If we now compare those two effects, so I, I show you now the combined two uh, effect slide. Uh, if you compare the bottom point of those, it's exactly the same. So both effects um, delay star formation. Um, and we ask ourselves the question, what is the interplay between those effects? Which one plays the stronger role? And of course, in our case, the solution to this problem is running more simulations. So we increased our simulation sample from four simulations with different streaming velocities and three simulations with no streaming velocity, but um, different Lamb and Werner backgrounds to a combination of those. And then we study the average halo mass for star formation. So how massive does a halo need to be to form stars? And what you can see here is um, the halo mass is a function of streaming velocity. And you can see this increases as we've seen before and understood before um, for both increasing streaming velocity. And then in different colors, I have the different Lamb and Werner backgrounds and it increases also for different Lamb and Werner backgrounds. But the streaming velocity plays the larger role. This increase here is larger than that increase here. And in order to characterize not only those 12 combinations, um, we applied a fitting formula and uh, it works very nicely because most of the universe um, has a streaming velocity between zero and one sigma. So when we take that into account, we can fit roughly 97% of the universe accurately based on those models with our fitting formula. As a last point, I would like to say, what do we want to do when we want to move away from the supercomputers and actually observe those population three stars directly at the time that they are born? Um, and for that, we did a fun little paper that came out yesterday on archive. It's, um, yeah, we submitted it to APJ Letters. So we have here the flux uh, of population three and population two sources with uh, very known models uh, from Sacrison and uh, from Brom 2001. And uh, we estimate that fiducially we have a thousand solar masses and stars. And in one of the models, we have a nebula in this one, and in this one, we don't. And we put them through the near cam filters of James Webb. And what we find is when we have an AB magnitude of uh, 39, then we can take population three stars. So we can see the majority of the population three stars in both models. Uh, but we can't really see the pop two stars. And this is exactly what we want. And we also checked that those can be detected and can be clearly identified as population three stars. So those here are brown dwarfs and they occupy only a minimal fraction of uh, the space. And those are only the very cloudy, cloudy brown dwarfs. And then there was a paper by Engel et al. 2008, who suggested a 100 te meter telescope on the moon and this is um, the telescope necessary to reach this 39th magnitude. So if you're interested in this uh, thought experiment, um, I would invite you to check out uh, yesterday's archive. And yeah, I, I leave you with my conclusions and I hope you have a few questions for me. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's great. And we're finally get to 100 meter telescopes. Um, so uh, on the Slack, there are a few questions. The first is from Xiaohan Wu. Uh, he, she said, I probably misunderstood this, but is initial condition not generated by a self-consistent calculation with a linear perturbation theory, or it just imposing a relative velocity between dark matter and gas? There are papers commenting on the accuracy of this type of initial condition generation. Could you comment on how this affects your results? Okay, so there's indeed, um, when you have larger simulation boxes, you need to take more into account um, that you have an effect. However, there has been a paper, I think this year from Yunbei Park, uh, that comments that um, it actually plays a very minor role uh, to um, take into account the temperature fluctuations that are associated um, with the um, fluctuations um, of the velocities. Um, so because our box sizes are quite small um, and because of Yunbei's paper, I think we are quite safe with the way we set up our initial conditions. Of course, like the dark matter um, density and fluctuations are created with a proper initial conditions code called, we use music for that. 
right, thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, let's see which one. There are a lot of questions actually. Is the Lyman Warner background in your simulation imposed or produced by the stars in your simulation? No, it's imposed. Um, so in order to do this parameter study, um, it is not a self-consistent, but it is an external Lyman Warner background. Uh, we turn it on at the redshift where we first uh, find um, our star formation conditions uh, to be fulfilled, which is redshift 24. Um, okay, we have time for one last question. What is the H2 temperature and how is it determined? Um, so um, you probably mean the temperature. Um, so oh wait, I have a slide for that. Um, so the H2 temperature um, can reach temperatures of 200 Kelvins. Um, and um, that is determined by the row vibrational states of molecular hydrogen. All right, thank you. So we're right at hour now. So uh, I thank all the speakers for uh, six great talks. And uh, Anna, you have many more questions that you can answer okay. on the Slack. Um, I look and forward to now, that. Yeah, and now we have another coffee break session, which you can find the, uh, the Zoom either in your email or on the Slack channel general. We're going to talk 